Hello. Uh, bonsoir. Um, thank you very much, Alex Katz, to be here. It's a great uh, honor for the Fondation Vuitton and for me to have a talk with you. And uh, we, we invite you because we have a, an exhibition that, that we visited before on what is painting uh, from the collection of the Fondation Vuitton, on which I work with the artistic team of the Foundation. And so, because well, you are probably uh, the most biggest painter today, or one of the most bigger, <laughs> we can talk about this after. <laughs> um, so it was great to have the possibility to talk with you. And you have a special event because you're, you have a show at the Orangerie uh, in Paris, so you have a strong uh, presence in Paris too. So may, we made a visit, small visit um, of the collection and you talk to me about fast, how fast you paint. Oh. And yeah, I, 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 we, we visit the impressionist and you tell me about this painting is slow. Oh, with the difference, uh, with the, the uh, impressionist paintings, uh, they go to the same place at the same time and it's an, a, a painting on top of a painting and it gives you um, more or less a time, but the light is very slow, and they were interested in the atmosphere. <clears throat> My paintings are, the, are about the initial flash of seeing something, and uh, it's all quick. And the, the light I want is a quick light, an immediate. I want the immediacy, and the, it, the I got to it uh, instinctually. I just loved it. Felt right. And then I rationalized later what, what, what it was about. And it went into the thing of uh, <clears throat> um, uh, eternity only exists in the present tense. In other words, there's no past and there's no future. There's only now. And to get the now, if you get it right, it's like that's, that's, that's the only eternity there is, I can see. So that's like a little... Um, uh, not the summing, but it, 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 it attacks the structure of fixed values. In other words, we, we live in a time where the, the fixed va values don't exist, really, for a lot of us. We, we live in a time of variables. Everything's a, a variable and changing. It's, everything is changing. Uh, new paintings change quicker than older paintings. But it's, we're, we, it's all about change. And so that makes the idea of the immediate present firmer for me, you know? The, uh, when I started to, you know, it took years to have any clarity of, of my instincts. And uh, there was like St. Augustus, Augustine, says the same thing. Uh, you know, no past, no future, only now. And he refers to God a lot. And uh, Gertrude Stein got to the same thing too. You know, no narrative. The narrative takes time. And the, the paintings uh, have no narrative. They're just a flash of something you see. There's no story. And we also eliminate content. Uh, content, um, is slow. You don't want any content, it's just a flash. The style is the content, which again seems kind of superficial, but that's what I, that's where I am. And you tell me how fast you have to paint. One painting has to be made. Well, it's, a, it's a, the process is, um, uh, I started out, uh, I studied modern art in a modern art school. There weren't very many in America. In America, was, when, when I started, it was a provincial city. <clears throat> and they had regional painting. And they had uh, School of Paris, uh, provincial. Provincial abstracts and semi-abstracts. And it was, a it was a world that was limited by that. But uh, in about 1950, Jackson Pollock just ripped it open. And the, the opportunity was to go into big time painting. You could just see it. 
and a lot of people just kept painting the paintings they were doing at that time, but I wanted, I wanted to go, go for it. And uh, <coughs> the French painting and painting like that, they, they use a descriptive line in its descriptive form, a lot of black line around objects. And uh, that was like what made a painting look good at that time. And I was going for, I wanted something more open. So my reference were, were Jackson Pollock, Bonard, and uh, Monet, who spread and didn't describe. And, uh, <clears throat> and I guess that was a, a trend in, that, in the town at the same time. You know, everyone was going that way. But most of the young people were painting uh, abstract. And <clears throat> uh, I wanted to paint representational. I wanted to paint a, a new representational painting. So the um, grammar of the painting comes from abstract painting. I'm involved in the abstract painting world. But the idea is to make something that looks new, that's realistic. And realistic is, <clears throat> is a variable. And I explain. Uh, uh, like Washington Park in New York, when I grew up, was a bad uh, water impressionist watercolor. And if you see it now, it's like a, a, a TV set. You've seen it so many times on TV that you can't see it any other way than TV. But it did exist before TV. And people did see it, but it was entirely different. And I'm getting at, uh, you think because you see something, it, it's permanent and real. It's not. It's cultural. You only see through the eyes of your culture. You can't see it through the eyes sometimes of other cultures. My example is Gombrich says, impressionist painting is real. African sculpture is symbolic. And I say, to whom? You know, to an African, uh, an impressionist painting doesn't make any sense at all. And his sculpture is real to him. So that's like a little unsettling. But that's where we are, you see culturally. And, and, and uh, reality is a variable, truth is a variable, everything's a variable, it's all moving, you know? And uh, that's what the paintings brought. And that's why like a lot of the resistance when, when the paintings were, uh, they're, although the subject matter is uh, ordinary, the this, this style isn't. And, uh, when I first showed here in 1975, the people were screaming in the gallery, and I had things in the book, in, in my book saying, send him back to art school. <laughs> yeah. And the, the gallery people were very, were very upset, and I said, well, it happened before in the States. You know? And there are very few artists who, who um, have people scream in the gallery that this is really terrible. And I felt embarrassed, because it is, I could see it as terrible to their eyes. No, but you just go on. And paintings that were were initially seen as cold and heartless, and people say they have sentiment now. So they, they look at paintings, and when they make paintings, sometimes they make a rough painting, and then 20 years later, it's it's okay, it's smooth, yeah. And sometimes the more finished paintings are, are not as interesting. What I'm saying, it's all, everything is moving. And that's like the, the big problem in the world, is that people want fixed values and stability, and uh, other people don't want it, you know? And so we, you have a lot of problems all over because of that. And you say you want to have no narratives and to no finally you, 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 you focus on colors and light. Style, style. 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 Yeah, the style is the whole thing. Because the older abstract guys said, you start with subject matter, the subject matter turns into form, and the form becomes the content. That was the AE abstract expressionist. And it seemed um, too pat to me. And, uh, and there was no room for style. And for me, style and light, the light and the style, the, the idea of time and light and style, are, are the cohesive thing in my, my painting. And, yeah, and uh, 
you, you say that uh, you are very you you are a great painter and do you think you paint how do you think you paint differently now from your beginnings is it uh, well the, do you the, think you make progress or just change or well i didn't have any conf confidence really when i started and um uh i got into <coughs> i left the real world when i was about 13 and a half <coughs> i went to a trade school because a friend of mine went there and the, the guy was a little older than me We had three artists on the block in Queens where I grew up. And one of them was a Bauhaus artist. And his father went down with the ship in the, in the war and he had to take care of the family. And he was halfway through Pat. He opened an uh, industrial design business. And I was 16, he was 18. And he, I, I did his illustrations for his, for, his, for his lamps. The other guy on the block was, was sort of like an Andy Warhol type. <clears throat> and he went, to, he, he went there and told me to go, and I followed him. He's a very good artist, you know, but like an illustrator. And uh, you have to realize that in the 50s, it was a really expanding, uh, expanding place with everyone, the energy was just enormous. Well, he, um, so I followed him to the commercial art school, and he, um, At 16, he, he said, I'm leaving, and the teacher said, why? He says, because you have nothing more to teach me. And went into, uh, into the advertising business, and by the time he was 18, he was running a big agency. He, he was an art director, making more money than his father or anyone else. Uh, but, he, he, but he worked uh, seven days a week. Since he was 14, he gave up sports. And... Uh, uh, That became like one of the things that um, I looked to, to that kind of, put that kind of energy into, into art. At any rate, when I went to, to this trade school, uh, they had antique drawings there, and I liked the drawings, and they had an antique setup, so I started doing antique drawings, and the teacher was very good at it, at teaching it. So I did antique drawings for about two years, and Got, got really good at it. Now, antique drawings uh, is totally useless. <laughs> If you have a subway token, you can go uptown with one, but that's about it. <laughs> and I realized that, it's just, but it's a system. And the system is the same system that, that Picasso came from. He did antique drawings, and the teacher says the same things that later on my design teacher in Cubism would say, you know, don't put whites and don't put blacks in your white harmonies, don't put blacks in your white harmonies and open up the edges. And it's the same words. So the, the, uh, when I was in Cubism, I was, I was very good at it because I was doing the same stuff from high school. And, uh, and, and the man took drawing, it would take one week to make a drawing. He drew every day for three hours. And the first day, you just put dots down. The second day, he connected in. The third day, he put in the blacks and the whites. And the fourth day, he put the tones inside. And the fifth day, you put a technique on top. You know? And uh, it's a methodical way of working. And outside of that, in that school, it was just a matter of uh, wearing clothes and dancing, the, the school. And then when I graduated, the teacher said, you know, Alex, you wasted four years here. <laughs> And I said, I had a great time. But the sense of uh, attention to style, mine, comes from that school. You know, it's like, shall I have a, a, an 18 inch cuff or shall I have a 17 inch cuff? It was a big issue. You know, C clothes and dancing. And the dancing was, um, uh, uh, The style was a, a new style. It was, they danced uh, jitterbug, but it was cool. No one moved very much. And you could only dance with people from Harlem or Jamaica. <laughs> you couldn't dance with anyone else in the United States because they wanted to jump up and down. We didn't jump up and down. And, the, and so that was the paying attention to style came from there. So when I got in the Navy, I, I took the test to Cooper Union. And it, the test, they have 1,800 people take the test, 5% got in, 
And one third had been there before. They were veterans, older veterans. And the other third went to music and art. And there was another third in between. And I was in that third, but I got a very high mark. And I, I, I was surprised. And what I deduced was, uh, uh, I have a great aptitude for art tests. That was, <laughs> and then uh, when we started, I said, if I don't get thrown out of the school in the first year, in, in the middle of the second year, I'm going to catch up and beat everyone. And that's exactly what happened. And I remember a, t a teacher gave me a C minus in lettering. And he said, you've done a lot of work, Alex, but you haven't had childbirth. <laughs> and I think he was right. And I took him the next year and aced him. But uh, from being uh, very insecure, by the time I got out of there, I had some uh, confidence. You know, that was it. And to be a fine artist, I thought you really had to be a genius, and I know I wasn't. And uh, when I started painting uh, directly from nature after going through three years of uh, modern art, uh, it just felt right. I said, I'm going for it. I said, if I can get this far, in three years in Cooper, uh, in 20 years I'll make some art. That was the idea, and uh, it, it worked out, just like that, yeah. yeah. Do, do you think you t your style, so if, if it's a subject, like change, or do you keep... It developed. It developed? It developed. You, you, you start with everything as what you, you have, the things you like and the things you don't like, uh -huh. you know. And uh, you, you just follow your, your instincts on what you like and what you don't like. And it seems like your career, you will very often, uh, à côté in French, you say, so close to, you are not doing the pop art, you are not pop. No, I'm before pop the, art. Sorry? I'm, I'm before pop art. <laughs> you're before, before pop art. But you're <laughs> figurative no. during expressionism and... Well, no, the thing is that the... Uh, Abstract expressionists had all this philosophic stuff that I thought was baloney. You know, I mean, you could read, you could, if you read it serious, if you read it seriously, you could punch holes in it. So I really didn't like it. I really couldn't take it serious. And then the other guys were all macho. You know, like macho is like a fake he man. And I couldn't take, I couldn't take any of that seriously. And um, so it was like. Man, just do what's in front of you, you know? And then I, I ran into, see the, in, in Cooper Union, it's a 5%, so everyone there is quite bright. But in my late 20s, I ran into people who were much smarter than anyone in Cooper Union. And I connected with them. And that had a big part. And the, the poets, a lot of the poets, and the poets were do, using everyday things in a sophisticated way, like uh, Frank O'Hara and Jimmy Schuyler and, Later, they won the Joe Brainerd later on, but he's in French, you can pick him up. Uh, I remember. But, uh, so, uh, you, you make art, uh, uh, it's, it, you know, the, the romantic story of the art being a genius and a seller, painting great paintings that will be remembered 200 years from now, doesn't, isn't, isn't true. <laughs> Artists who make, make things for the whole place, are involved culturally with lots of different people. And, and it's that um, contact with, with, your, with your time and people that makes the art. It's like a real collaborative. I don't feel like I make it by myself. I, I, you know, I paint it, but uh, the, uh, the, I wouldn't make it if I didn't have arguments with other artists, <laughs> for one thing. Uh, and it seems that your work, you paint your uh, clothes, the people of your family, people you loved, and it's well, very often very happy view of life. Is well, it a choice or is it your it's life? Like the, well, when you say, like the uh, impressions painted with rose-colored glasses, yeah. right? And they got away with it. When I paint with rose-colored glasses, people get upset about it. <laughs> because there's no anguish. And uh, I liked a lot of um, Impressionist painting. It's a form of escapism in a way, which seems natural to me. Okay. And do you, st you, do you still 
um, you, you paint when you paint do you think um, to, to who do you think do you think to you yourself well, when I paint I'm just trying to get the paint on the canvas believe me <laughs> <laughs> All my, all my thoughts of, are getting the paint on the canvas right, you know? And uh, the, the, they're, they're like, like, I would say like there are five audiences and they all see a different painting, you know? Like the painters look at how it's, how it's painted. Uh, a museum person thinks of a painting as how it'll last in time. A collector thinks of how good it'll look, and, right? A dealer looks at it, how he can sell it. And uh, you have these people, they, they actually see different paintings. <laughs> and, and you, as a painter, you know, you would like to have all four, five audiences in your lap. And you really can have one or two for any length of time. <laughs> but I think the primary, I've always had a strong response from painters and from poets. That's my strongest. I've had uh, trouble uh, with um, uh, well, collectors and didn't like my paintings at all. And, uh, uh, institutions don't care. They, they're all behind the time, you know. <laughs> so we're in front. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, yeah, you, you say at the beginning of your career, you, you wanted to knocking out the bouncers, means like to f end. Yeah, yeah, very... yeah, yeah. Well, I want, well, it goes like this. I go to see the, the Kooning show, the opening. He has the daughter of the river. Those things in the late 50s. And I look at him and say, boy, these things are fantastic. They're so rough, big and rough and strong. I said, I want to knock them off the wall. That was it, just like that, competitive. I want to make a painting that beats that painting down. It has nothing to do with making something better. It's just the quality. Of course, like a, a Rothko, was, uh, Rothko is like in the late 50s, early 60s, a fantastic painting. But uh, a lot of paintings could eat them up, you know? To have better, better, stronger internal scale. So, but that, that, that was a quality that, that was part of the paintings. They're aggressive. Uh -huh. They don't seem so when you're looking at a pretty girl <laughs> or a little house. You stick it next to someone else's painting and you see it's like a mad dog. <laughs> and you, you, your work is about energy? A lot of. Yeah, energy is, energy is the whole thing, yeah. How much energy a painting can give you, and, and how many, how much energy you give to the painting, because you make you well. A lot of it's intellectual, a lot of it's manual. Yeah. You know. And is it like for you, like a performance to, to well, work, like a physical uh, uh, fight, or is it? Well, it's physical, but I, I don't really. I think it's uh, more mental. You know, I mean, the, the paintings look physical. I paint large paintings. You know. Yeah. But I don't think of it as uh, uh, a real. Phys I don't think of it as physical strain. Uh -huh. And do you think because you make you keep you want to keep the instant in the way you paint very fast? Do you think that some paintings are wrong, or and do you keep them? Well, or? it works with me. <coughs> anyway, um, uh, my father. <coughs> was supposed to be a scholar, you know. And he said his blood was too hot, he became a playboy. <laughs> but all the things from uh, Talmud thinking went into like time and motion. And so he, 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 everything, every move he made he was thought of. It was all time and motion. And uh, that's part of it, part of the speed thing. And the energy, the uh, energy of the, uh, the Russians are like violent, and they do everything very fast. And I think I got that from him. You, know, you don't go very far from your parents. And you, your work is very um, American by many ways because you, you are in the American culture. You never, you didn't came to Europe before. You were 35, and you make big, huge painting, and very, you keep the flatness. And in the other way. You quote uh, Matisse or uh, Monet, like, like inspiration. Yeah, well, they, 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 the, the uh, French painting is uh, is like the history of what you do for me. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, the Matisse, uh, 
when I was when I was in last year in Cooper Union, the teacher says, "There's a Matisse show. <laughs> you know, go see it. He's he's, a, he's an old man. He's 80 years old, <laughs> but the, he's a pretty good painter." And I look at the teacher who's 65, and there's no difference between 65 and 80 to me <laughs> at all. So I went and saw the show and fainted. I caught myself before. I couldn't believe anyone could paint that well. Yeah. It took years to be able to see it, but when I first saw my sheep, they seemed a little sloppy, coming from antique drawing. But when I saw those paintings, the skill in them, I thought, was totally unbelievable. Like, and when you compare him to <coughs> Raphael of Alasquith, he does it uh, with more ease, you know. And that was like, uh, uh, you say, well, you, you, you look at, the, uh, other paintings that you want to find out the directions. And in, in New York at the time, they didn't have a lot of really good paintings, really big time. And they had a, a loan show from uh, Vienna. And they had these Velasquez and Rembrandts that were way better than anything we had in the city. And I remember looking at a, a Velasquez and saying, that, that's, that's the, the Styling concept is what I want. <clears throat> there was nothing there, and it was great. And the Rembrandt painting looked as great, but I knew it was a, a little corny, you know. And uh, they were eye openers. So you you see different things, and they just um, they um, direct you. And and you have a very specific pro process to work because you make some sketch, and after you enlarge. Well, it's the only way I could get to those large paintings. Because the, the first paintings were kind of small, the first 10 years, they finally get up to uh, a meter and a half by this or something like that, into the 60s. And then I, the challenge was to get away from Matisse and like Picasso can't paint a large picture. You know, for me, Guernica is a great piece of graphic art, but it doesn't expand like a Veronese, you know, or a Pollock. <clears throat> so, I think the older guys <coughs> wanted to get away from around French painting, uh, Matisse and Picasso, and they went to large scale. I think that's what I thought. And uh, the idea of making a large scale figurative painting seemed like you had the world to yourself. No? And that's it. And, and the uh, uh, popular imagery w gave you opportunities to open a canvas up in a way that no one else had had. had. So I'm getting <coughs> imagery ideas from <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, TV. A TV is a, is a box this big, and they smash it into your living room, and you have to see it. So I start cropping figures to get that energy so it could compete with the, with the de Kooning on, a, on the energy. When you crop it, it just the image goes flying out, and the billboards were fabulous. And, and the uh, westerns, I used to go finish work, I carved frames and for three days a week, and then I'd go <coughs> into a movie. They were not films; they were movies at that time. And I'd pay my money and walk in and sit down and see what the movie was. I mean, I didn't look at the marquee. I just wanted to see a movie. And the movie, they were making a lot of westerns. And the western, you see a head on this side and a lot of land on that side. Well, I never saw it in the painting. <laughs> and so it gave you a, a new vocabulary of images from all these popular, popular art things. And you're making a new painting. Well, that was the thing. You want to make a new painting. You don't want to make your father's painting. You know? And yeah, you say a good artist is something, someone who renew art, and when you paint, do you try to renew your art, or do you feel your instinct and it? This evolves? is mostly instinctive. You, you know, I did a whole bunch of paintings with bright yellow, and it was I was using no color, and it got kind of boring. So I said, oh, what the hell? Let's put some yellow in. I hadn't used that in 20, 30 years, and it looked interesting. So it made a whole suite of paintings. You, you just uh, follow your instincts and um, uh, you don't let yourself get bored. That's the killer. Uh, a, a lot of painters find truth and they keep painting it 
you know, over and over again. And uh, it's very boring idea to me. Truth, you know, to really do truth over again is like a boring idea. Uh, so you, sp you, yeah, you don't want to be bored in your studio. No, and you, so you make the same job. Yeah, just do something else, yeah. Uh, so you do the same jobs in 70 years, but you're mm. still not boring. No, I'm frightened. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact. <laughs> When you do something new, okay, I've had a show now in, in Gavin Brown's, they're big landscapes, you know, one of the big 12 by uh, 10 by 16 feet. And, and uh, I, find that I found this year before that I tried to paint the sensation of what someone wrote about something. That's a completely against anything I've done. And I painted the painting, the painting is terrific. So I said, you got to do it again. And I don't know how to get at that. And so I did some things and uh, uh, I decided, I, I, they've stopped working with images that I remember, which I, know, I have no, not a good memory. So I'm insecure about it and I blew them up, and then I'm painting these paintings without any uh, cartoons preparation on the canvas, which is what the figure paintings all have, and I'm painting them like wet and wet. So you put a coat of paint on the canvas, and you look at your sketches, and you start to paint. And it's a pretty scary idea, but it's plenty exciting. <laughs> and the, the, that's why you're gonna be, you gotta, you gotta be uh, I think you have to run, you have to renew yourself with fear. Yeah. So you're still uh, yeah, in danger. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, well, most of the other guys, a lot of the eight guys just found truth and they're very smug about it, you know. Uh -huh. and, and do you, do you um, look at other artists' works? At the beginning, I, I can believe, but now do you still? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I see shows and stuff, yeah. And uh, I like fashion is a part of it, and seeing other paintings have to do with yourself and time. And are you still are you more interested in painting or in art in general? No, you? I'm more interested in painting. Uh, 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 the, the painting world was rather a small world in 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 the 50s, and when you it, when you had exhibit in, in uh, a gallery, everyone in the art world would see it. Uh -huh. And now it's all over the place. You can have a show in a big, in, in a major gallery, and, and a lot of people won't see it. It's it gotten the art world has gotten much larger, and it's gotten more diversified. The uh, definition of art and painting has changed a great deal, and so there are all these um, you know, conceptual art ideas and surrealist ideas that. Uh, 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 expanded in, in the, in, in, into, the, into painting. And the, a lot of the, well, uh, I think the majority of art work that's uh, being done comes from universities and from uh, art history and philosophy courses. And with that, you can be a mature artist at 18 and 19. If you're bright, you read the stuff, you get it all, and you can make something that has some sense when you're 18. But I think with the uh, painting, it takes a longer time to put, it, put, put your stuff together. And I think most of the painters don't get their style together till the, the interesting ones, usually till 35 or 45. That's a long time, to <laughs> from 20 to 35, to get your stuff together, you know? Yeah. But you find out who's your, who's your contemporaries when they've hit 35 and 45. You don't know. There are other people who are developed, and they're, they're very sexy, but after 30, they're gone. You know? Yeah. And they, they, they have the action. And then the serious painters, I think, for the most part, develop a little slower. So it, it's, the art world has changed a great deal. You know? it, it has an a, a enormous amount of energy, the art world. And enormous audiences like it, and they like all the different aspects of it, the stuff they can like, relate to. And uh, it has a lot of energy, the art world, yeah.
And if you, if you, when you start, painting was... No, very way. small, very small. Yeah. And not, not a lot of energy and uh, oh, kind of romantic and sad. <laughs> a lot of sad lives. <laughs> um, Good. Yeah. But a lot of people will paint, and they paint and they try and it doesn't work out to their aspirations. And uh, they, they somehow uh, don't feel well about themselves. And people react in different ways. Sometimes, some accept that as a fact, and others uh, get really mean and hostile about it. You know. But it, it, it's, it's a, a basically a hard, a hard business. Uh, you, you said once that when you paint, you paint for yourself or you paint for the other and... Oh, I think professional is... painter, paint, you paint from, your, from you inside, but you paint for other people. Uh -huh. and, and we see the exhibition and huh? when we see the exhibition, we saw the John Mitchell painting and you told me she, she wanted to be a big painter but she wasn't a great, uh, a great painter. No, I think, yeah, I think he's a, uh, a very good painter. Uh-huh. Uh, amazingly uh, skillful. But it, it didn't have the, the, the social hostility that my work has. We're the same age. <laughs> and she's painting like her father, and I'm trying to knock my father out. <laughs> Still so it's no. different. My work is much more hostile. But she's terrific, and she, she has the thing of being able to make you really see what the color is, uh -huh. you know? The very few artists can take the pigment and make it look like they, they kill it, usually, yeah. Um, maybe if some questions, or, or if you want to continue. <laughs> Do, do, um, maybe we can ask some questions. Uh, yeah. Um, you implied earlier that uh, one of your motivations for painting um, was the arguments you have with other painters. And I uh, would be interested to hear what those arguments are about. What, what'd you say? Um, she says that you, one of your fav most important audience was the painters, yeah. and she wanted to know what are your arguments for that. No, no, no? that's not what I said. <laughs> earlier, earlier you said that um, you were sometimes motivated by the arguments you have with other oh, painters. Yeah. And I'd be interested to know what those arguments are. Okay. In the uh, early... Uh, <clears throat> uh, 50s into the 60s, everyone was talking about space. No? Space was the big thing. Now no one's interested in space. They're interested in identity. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, the painter had a studio next to me named Al Held. And he had a friend named George Sugarman. George Sugarman's a sculptor. George Sugarman was a very strong intellectual. And Al did a flat painting, and George said, you overlapped a plane. You're nothing but a neo-cubist. He didn't speak to him for two years. <laughs> Those are the kind of silly arguments that went around. But what, what happened out of that, when I heard that, I said, I don't overlap. And I started to overlap volumes. That was my response to that, was I, I'll overlap as many volumes as I can. And, and George can go fly a kite. Do you look for a kind of flatness? Do you want to say? Yeah, I want the surface. That's the thing we... Uh, we, we, we the uh, guys in the 50s, um, um, Larry Rivers and uh, Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, had soft surfaces. And, uh, 
uh, a noodling, a noodling painting with a soft surface. I, uh, Al Hell, myself, and Philip Carlson, we all want a hard surface. No? Start the painting on the surface and keep it on the surface. Right. Um, thank you very much. I would have a question. Um, what about, um, are, are there any instances where you had an idea, you wanted to paint something, in an object, a person, and it didn't work? And you simply were not able to realize what you had in mind? Uh, well, when I was experimenting, with exper paint, when I was painting early, I, I busted up a thousand paintings. So that answer that? <laughs> Hello. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this exhibition here at the moment, uh, the survey of painting from whatever it is, the 60s to now, 90% um, of it seems to be abstract. Maybe you're, not, you're the only figurative painter in the show. Um, do you have any feeling about that? Do you have anything to say about that? He says that the, in the exhibition, yeah. you are the only figurative artist. What do, how do you feel that? Oh. <laughs> Given that it's a survey of you know, important yeah. work yeah, from the look, last 50 they look, years. They look a little weird in the context, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, <clears throat> the figuration thing and the realistic figuration is <clears throat> When I first showed a painting in New York City, in an in a, in a avant-garde gallery, an older painting came up to me, an older painter came over to me and said, figuration is obsolete and color is French. <laughs> and I said to you, <laughs> and my, I just followed my instincts and, and it led me into these paintings, but uh, it's, at this point in my life it sort of uh, got so people can accept them in, 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 the, in this context, you know? I think early on it couldn't be accepted. And I, I have a kind of a usual question, but do you, how do, what is your rhythm of painting? Do you have very regular time? Like uh. in the, what is your rhythm when you paint? Do you paint every day, five oh. hours? Or well, it's flat out, seven days a week. Seven, okay. But when I, if I'm doing large paintings, the actual production of a painting might be one day a week. And if I'm going overworked, it'd be two, that at all. But I'm work, I work every day, seven days a week. It's flat out. Cause I always felt, you know, like, <clears throat> in the competitive sense, I want to compete with the best. They put, they put flat out energy, and I did too, and I want to uh, do it too, you know. And I think if you don't put uh, mental en energy, just a physical en energy, like a donkey. There are a lot of donkey painters, they paint every day. <laughs> so I don't want to be in that category. And, and during, the, during the time you are in the studio, do you um, keep, a, keep a long time like oh, I can have a day's work in 20 minutes. Sorry? I can have a day's work in 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> That might be a sketch. A sketch might be 20 minutes. I don't feel guilty. When I first started, I felt a little guilty that other people went to work and I worked 20 minutes or half hour. <laughs> but I, I, I don't feel guilty about it at all. Hello. Uh, so first, uh, sorry for my English. <laughs> uh, I remember the exhibition Beach Scene in uh, Ropac, maybe it was in the early 2000s, and there, were, there was a very large scale painting with um, maybe six or seven figures. 
um, just in front of the, the beach and they, they were sitting in a plastic white chair and it was like a bar relief or like a frieze but very big and uh, you have been talking about style a lot and uh, I ask myself if uh, does it mean something to you the Cezanne sentence making Poussin from nature? What does it mean? Yeah. <laughs> he asked, <what? laughs> um, he asked uh, there is a, a quotation of Cézanne who, who says, uh, Cézanne, the French painter, who yeah. says, um, the goal is to make, uh, like, to paint like uh, Poussin, but from nature, to, to be inspired by nature and to make something very composed like Poussin's work. Oh. No, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. I like I like Cezanne, and uh, but I never like Poussin. <laughs> it, it, it seems to, someone told me that that he's a bourgeois painter. And Cezanne or uh, made for made, he made paintings for priests with, with a bourgeois, <laughs> and um, the, I never liked the color. I liked the drawings, but I never liked the color. The color always offended me, and. and um, uh, uh, Cezanne, or I liked the first artist I liked. I liked him because of the emotional force. And uh, I was told he was intellectual when I got to art school, but I really liked the emotional force in it. And then I said, well, maybe I didn't understand it. And then 20 years later, I said, no, I was right the first time. <laughs> and you, you paint in a huge scale? Some painting, some of your paintings are huge, mm -hmm. and do you want do you, so? You have two perceptions. One is you, you are inside the painting because you are very close and you are lost in the painting. yeah. The environmental paintings, yeah. yeah. The, the landscapes were, were big landscapes. We did it all. Uh, I had I had a retrospective in the Whitney, <laughs> and uh, for me, most retrospectives are failures. They don't get the right amount of paintings in the right space. And then once they're successful, the artist just keeps painting masterpieces. Well, that was not an interesting idea to me. So I went into these uh, environmental landscapes. You know, the landscapes that wrap around you. Landscapes are like, a lot of them like the Monet's, like a hole in the wall where you really see something. But I wanted to be like a, uh, around you. <laughs> and so I went into these very large, and you needed a certain, a certain amount of size to, to get it to work. So I started painting very large paintings. Oh. Yeah. Um, I believe I'm here. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he's, he's I, I see that now you're living in Maine, in the state of Maine. Um, has, and your landscape seemed to be influenced a bit by that. Have you been in, influenced by artists like Neil Welliver or any of the, any, any of the more flat color, colorists? Oh, what's this? I, well, I know them, but uh, it, I know. I mean, you look at the backgrounds of your paintings and it's almost like a, they're more flat, like his, like his. Yeah. Well, the, um, the, the, the main thing was, um, oh, uh, I got a scholarship there, you know, right? And to an art school, a regional art school. And I liked the light, and I liked uh, the fact I could paint in, on a sidewalk, and it wasn't weird. Where I grew up in Queens, it was like suburbs. And if I put an easel on the street and painted, people would say, there's that crazy kid again. <laughs> He's nuts, you know? But there it was just like, uh, like a carpenter. There was a lot of people painting, and people just, it was just another occupation. So socially, it was great. And optically, it was great, because where I was was inland, and no one had owned that thing visually. So I had a chance to see it. And that was, that was the uh, thing that sustained it. And it has a lot of variety of motifs that I could do. I could do the beach one summer. I can do Black Brook the other summer. You know, keep, keep, keep moving around, okay? Okay, thank you very much, Alex. It was great for, for me, I hope for you too, <laughs> to be here.
Okay, so it's, and again, you can see the paintings <laughs> now. Now you see the painter, now you can see the paintings upstairs, and there will be a book signing um, just uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much for all. Merci beaucoup à, à vous. Bonne soirée.